when you put the beard behind me, what we're doing. <laughs> Discussing this uh, topic about the future of um, uh, compassion based therapies, mindfulness, for psychology, and so on, uh, especially in relation to health and health professions, but I think we can go as generally as we want to. And um, I'm, I have to say, I'm so glad they didn't sit down with two women on one side and two men on the other. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, as before, uh, you each have five minutes each uh, to say a few words, to get us going, and then we'll pull in people from the uh, group, and um, we'll see how it goes. That's the uh, format. Um, would you like to start? Since you're sort of in the swing already. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go to the other end? <laughs> Looks like it's gentleman first. <laughs> Emancipation. <laughs> Do you want to start, sir? Okay. Uh, Let me give you the microphone. Yeah. Maybe Seth could have an opportunity to introduce, introduce himself, himself because yes, he's that's just right, so because a bit more than five yes. <laughs> yes. so That's yeah. right, everybody else is sort of well known in the group. Okay. I'm uh, Xanthon Le Pitten, I'm a um, member of the Belgian Sangha, which has been founded by uh, Dagmar Fidia. Uh, I used to be a member of a local Sangha in Leuven, uh, where I I live in the neighborhood of Louvain, Leuven, but we have uh, stopped with our song of it. It's a long story. Uh, I'm a psychotherapist for uh, 30 years or something like that. Uh, and I, I have given many courses, workshops on meditation, uh, a Buddhist approach to problems, a sort of embryo of Buddhist therapy at the time. Uh, and since the beginning of my work as a therapist, 30 years ago, I was interested in Buddhism and I think I have integrated from the beginning in a, in a very moderate way, uh, I've been uh, integrating Buddhism and Western, psychology, uh, Western therapy. I'm a Gestalt therapist, which makes it easy to integrate because Gestalt has some elementary Zen uh, elements in it, in its theory and in its practice. So it's been, uh, it, it wasn't a gap for me. To, um, one thing I want to say about Buddhism and therapy is that I think that it's very important, even if we are Buddhist, I'm a Buddhist, if I am in a therapeutic situation with a client or clients, in the first place I'm a therapist. And I can clarify that by one example. I have one client who has been in therapy for more than 20 years now. He's, he, he's 50. And when I had the intake with him, I, I asked him, what have you done in therapy that we don't have to do? What, what is required for you? What is, for instance, did you work on your childhood? Because he's been very, he had a very severe parents. He was undermined. He was, uh, uh, how do you say that? Uh, his legs were slashed from, from him. Uh, and I asked him, have you worked on that? And he said, no. And to me that was, it feels not good <laughs> that if he's been in therapy for 20 years, which I won't mention names, but some famous uh, Buddhist therapists in uh, 
Belgium and uh, Holland. And he didn't work on his early childhood. <clears throat> that for me is troubling. So I think one thing I want to say about uh, Buddhist, Buddhism and therapy, or what, uh, Buddhist therapy, is that in the first place we have to be therapists and see the vital elements of what is needed for our clients. On the other hand, <laughs> uh, what I, what my experience from the beginning was that it's very natural and very easy, it was very easy for me to integrate, for instance, meditation in my therapist practice. Especially, for instance, with people who are anxious or very rigid, to ask them to sit upright and to be aware of their uh, breathing and uh, be aware of their breathing, for instance, or uh, contact with the with the with the herbs. Uh, how you say that in English? Uh, grounding. 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 Yeah, to grounding. Uh, these are things that help people a lot. It helped me. Tremendously in my life. So there is a, a thing on the other hand. So if we integrate med meditation practice in therapy, it's quite natural for most of people. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I, I, it's very rare that I met people who had resistance against meditation. And if they had, I didn't call it meditation, I called it relaxation, for instance. <laughs> yes. so, um, another thing I want to say about Buddhism and therapy and Buddhist therapy is that it has always struck me that in Western therapy there are so many currents and they, sometimes they behave like sects. They, 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 they don't believe in each other principles. And, different and, schools. Yeah, different schools. And, and, I hope that is not <laughs> the future of Buddhist therapy, that we work alongside uh, Zen therapy and Vajrayana and, and, uh, and Vipassana and, and, and uh, evidence-based therapy. And, and that's one of my hopes that in situations like these, in conferences, we, we, we deal with each other, we, we learn from each other. And I say that also because as a Western therapist, I have been very much, I'm, I'm very grateful that I had a Gestalt background, but also I have been trained in contextual therapy, uh, a little bit in systemic uh, therapy. I used focusing from, uh, of genuine, for instance, it, it goes very well with uh, Buddhist therapy. It's, 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 all, it's, it's a basic Buddhist therapy approach, I think. And I hope uh, in, in Buddhism we can avoid this uh, thinking that my own way is the best and the others are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Yes. Elena? Okay. Um, I'm not sure I really understand the topic correctly. <laughs> You can make it up. Make it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, building on what I just heard. <coughs> um, what I like about the Buddhism and all this thing that it gives so much, um, puts so much attention that a person can really do things himself. <coughs> And because as a therapist, I see him once a week for one hour, and it's just a small window. I don't know, maybe whatever he's telling me is 10%, and we create the whole universe, but it's just one hour of his life. And so, and my goal is, as a therapist, so there would be real changes in his real life. And it's not that I'm saying that therapy is not real, but it is something you know, we, we're not friends, it's a different relationship. And you really need to have friends in social environment, connect with people outside of my room. Uh, so when I have this, something that I can really, um, I 
would say prescribe, as, since I'm a psychiatrist, <laughs> prescribe, <coughs> focus our attention on meditation or any task, like you know, teachers do, you know, sometimes go lay down. I, I had a, a very interesting client, she, she had an affair, and she had a lot of guilt that she did it. And she came in and she said, I would work three sessions, and I said, session, said, I think I need to be punished for that. And I said, okay, let's, let's find out how you want to be punished for that. And she said, I don't know. And, and she said, punishment should be coming from my husband. I said, okay, then go ask him, he won't punish you. <laughs> <laughs> so she went home, and they talked, and she said, you know, he can't really punish me. He says, it's, it's not really good. He already forgave me, but I can't do it for myself. I said, well, there's no way he has to punish you. You need a punishment. You say you need it, you, you have to get it. So we elaborate. She, maybe she shouldn't eat. Maybe she shouldn't you know, buy something for herself, all these things. And nothing fits. And then I remembered one thing I read in a book, and I say, okay, how about this one? You go outside on the street, you find a big, big, um, how, how we call it, uh, on the ground after after the rain? Puddle. Okay. Puddle, oh. right. You find a big puddle. You lay down in a puddle. <laughs> and you, you lay down in that puddle as long as it's needed. As soon as you stand up, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> Goes, I'm not sure if that's a good one. <laughs> so, well, it's a good punishment, you know. It's, it's really it's social. People will see you there. You will stand up all dirty. <laughs> and so she was like, she started to be really a strange about it. And she, it's actually a good idea. Yeah, I'm going to be all dirty laying in that one. We have a lot of pools outside. I have to talk with my husband first. Said, okay, talk to your husband, maybe. <laughs> so she goes to her husband. Husband, of course, says, it's kind of too much. I'm not going to go there with you. <laughs> <laughs> so they keep talking about this. And actually, she never did it. But she was imagining it or uh, uh, doing this kind of things. And they now starting to get better with each other. And that, that's kind of a prescription I would give her. Uh, and as my role was just giving it to her, and her her role was to do it, go every day and do the meditation, do this check-in with herself or with her husband. So, <coughs> to, to give some kind of a tool that client can use on an everyday basis, that's what I really like about Buddhism, it's a practice. This is going to be meditation or something else, it doesn't matter for me, actually, I'm a therapist. I'm just going to join what's coming in. So that's why uh, I really like this approach and I use it, I combine it with everything I have. And the second thing is, I know we, like we talk here a lot about giving to others, but I know from my experience that you can give to others only before you give it to yourself. Just because you know the experience. And when you have the experience, you know how to share it, how to give the prescription or something else. And for me, as per personally, it just was about that. I, I learned what is self-compassion. I learned what is, because people talk about it, what is it, and like that. <laughs> and I learned it practically. So as a therapist, if you know, have this knowledge, if you have your own practice, it's very important. And actually, I haven't seen uh, in Eric's Sorin approach or any other approaches yet, anything that would introduce that practice for a therapist, self-care and all this thing. So I, that's a very valuable thing, that you could keep giving more and more clients this. Okay. That's what I think. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Last friend? Why am I sitting at the level? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, it's funny that I'm here uh, in this environment with you uh, to share about experiences and practice. And I think uh, healthcare doesn't take 
care of this fact that there are people which are really interested in subjects like meditation, Buddhism as well, and it's really rare to have this kind of opportunity to share this kind of knowledge together. And in one way it's like that, that from historical background, meditation and psychotherapy have nothing in common in a way, historically seen. Yeah, there are some where Carl Gustav Jung, you know, he, he was interested in mandala and uh, esoteric Buddhism and so on. And the early philosophers like Schopenhauer had a big interest in it, but, you know, historically seen, Western psychotherapy is completely different from meditation or something like that. It's completely a different approach. And so, I think it's a very important process we are in, and I think it's, it's, it's a lot of information which is needed still and research on meditation, especially on different methods of meditation, different means of meditation, and uh, how to apply it and how to exchange this with clients. And um, I'm, I'm much more on the, on the skeptic side of, of this because I, I'm, I got clients which really have mental disturbances and um, disorders from meditation because nobody took care of it in advance um, what kind of condition they had. And uh, for me this is a very important topic and I hope that through information as well as research groups uh, on the subject of meditation, um, Buddhist psychology can, can just be more integrated in this kind of process and uh, understood as a, as a kind of approach, especially the Abhidharma is so wonderful, it's, it, it's such a, a deep uh, resource uh, on power and uh, application. Yeah? All the symbolics, all the colors, all the elements, the five skandhas, everything, it's, so, it's, it's a vast thing. And I hope that we can uh, just uh, discover more of this. But on the other hand, I think uh, really um, uh, many, uh, more studies have, been, uh, have, have to be done on this subject. And there was one study from Grabmeier in 2008 uh, from Austria, and he showed that the, the presence and the practice of the, of the, of the um, psychotherapist is much more, uh, has a big impact on the, in, on the outcome of the therapy in, in the clinical trials. And uh, I think uh, this study was well done. It, it, it's one of the few which are well done in a big range of case studies and whatever, which are really which have no benefit and, uh, at all. And this, uh, this is one of the examples. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think we have to go for proper research as well. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I, I agree on that one, and it's wonderful that there is more research uh, these days. And also what you mentioned is you know, our own personal practice is kind of perspiring in how we interact with people. So that's bottom line for me. Um, uh, whether it's evidence-based or not, you know, something is happening in this interaction with, with other people. And when I look at Buddhist informed practices, there were therapies, you know, like this afternoon we did a the big mind, big heart, and I still regret that I couldn't do, give you a little taste of how you can work with a client therapeutically with it, and not so much like on a personal development level or a personal growth <laughs> or awakening. Um, but um, I have worked as a therapist in a psychology center for eight years, so I work with people. Um, and basically I used this technique there also. I just wouldn't call it big mind, big heart. Just would call it voice work. Or if someone comes in really agitated, I would say, you know, <coughs> let's be silent together before we start. Say so we start there, but before we start, let's be silent for a little bit. And I would 
help them ground. You know, that's not specifically Buddhist, but it's it's it's, it's a helpful technique. Um, and also, in um, when I was thinking, uh, looking back at, I um, took refuge in '89, and I was a little embarrassed to tell people that I became a Buddhist because in those days you must be a little awkward, especially as a Roman Catholic girl, to become a Buddhist. <laughs> and why would you do that? And now it's so mainstream already and so accepted. Uh, and not only uh, in the therapeutic work, but also in, in healthcare. So when I uh, teach on um, uh, end of life care or palliative care, you know, it's basically again a combination of uh, Western psychology and, and Eastern wisdom, and not just from Zen, but from you know the whole range of Buddhist. Um, uh, Upayan, skillful means, uh, insights, technologies. And it's accepted, you know, in hospices, in, in uh, hospitals, not just in a kind of spiritual um, um, field, where people are more open to a Buddhist approaches. And um, my teacher, John Melifax, she is really a lot, she's completely focused, well, she's focused on a lot of people. Um, on um, compassion-based um, practices. And she developed this model that's called GRACE. You can look it up, she wrote many articles about it. That's very helpful for healthcare professionals um, in order to, how can you cultivate compassion? We can talk a lot about it and by doing our meditation practice, it's kind of a byproduct that's coming up. But how can, a regular um, medical health professional who's not so much into a spiritual practice or in a daily meditation practice, how can they um, develop compassion in themselves? And it's just basic steps that she's offering and she's you know, traveling to all medical schools and, and hospitals in the US but also in the East and Asia she's asked to come there. So that's something that makes me happy that it's so more and more accepted to include this kind of uh, approaches in, uh, uh, both in mental health care and in uh, um, health care in general. Um, and the rest in Africa. Okay. So, we've had a, quite a range of, of points made the importance of um, uh, being a therapist in the full sense and, and uh, uh, took it slightly from what you were saying, like not just staying in the here and now in a kind of um, restrictive way, um, but looking at the whole life of the person and also an appeal not to get uh, sectarian, not to get uh, narrow down into little tight groups, reject other groups, and uh, having uh, a practice for the therapist. Um, and um, what was the first point that you made? The, the, so you bring the, changes in life of a person. Yes, 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 because you were like prescribing a practice that the person could then continue. But also I, I took from that there was, a, there was quite a sort of I suppose Ericksonian dimension to that, that the, the, there was a, almost a sort of trick in, the, in the, the thing that was prescribed because it then led her into talking to her husband in a new way. Yes, yeah. yeah. So that, that's, that's quite interesting because, um, you know, a lot of the, the sort of Zen stories are a bit like that, where, where somebody's um, system is destabilized in some way. And, um, you yeah, know, what happened over here? <laughs> 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 you, um, you were talking about well, in a way there's a bit, a bit of a contrast because you were, you were saying how accepted um, Buddhist-based practices are, and you were saying how rare it is. Um, so, so there's, there's obviously we're in the middle of a sort of process of, of how, uh, in some places, things are being um, integrated, accepted. In some places. What's that all about? And, and 
what are you talking about, and, and so on. Yes, so You're becoming more and more accepted. That's right. So, so some sort of process yeah. going on, and, and um, of course there, there's a lot of, of um, how, in what way. Mm -hmm. um, do, do we have to, because like you talked about, um, sometimes you have to take out all the Buddhist terminology mm -hmm. so that it can be accepted. And, and of course we know about how like mindfulness, this conference is about mindfulness, um, different groups have um, secularized it to varying degrees uh, in order to make it acceptable. So, so there's a very interesting process going on there. So let's open it up to the floor. Um, contributions, questions, comments. Um, last time it, it worked very nicely. Uh, we had several contributions from the floor. And when I look back, for me, the word acceptance was one uh, that, that changed me uh, through Buddhism a lot, acceptance. So when you look at Buddhism in, in Western healthcare, I find acceptance a very uh, basic, basic um, attitude in contrast of the <coughs> Western, where we more solve the problems. So the difference between solving problems and accepting and looking to them. So I find that a Buddhist richness. Uh, yeah. Richness. <laughs> okay. Okay. Key point for you. Yes. 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 Um, I think uh, I have two perspectives. One is about our our role in this uh, in answering and implementing and making the the positive uh, answer for this question. It's in our hands, I think. Like we are, you know, you know, a pocket in the big society, and we can influence by our students and therap and um, clients. It reminds me a story about. Um, a man, there was a man, very man in Jerusalem, very wise man, old man, that everybody said that he knows everything and he knows the future and he knows everything about everybody. So one man, young man said, okay, I'll, I'll trick him because I will show everybody that he doesn't know anything about me. So I'll take a butterfly in my hand and I'll ask him what there is in my hand and let's see if he would know that I have a butterfly. And if he would know that I have a butterfly, I will ask him if the butterfly is alive or dead. So, if he will say that he is uh, dead, I will open it. The butterfly is, uh, is alive. And if he will say he's alive, I can <laughs> <one. laughs> So, that's the way I trick him so he cannot answer and I'll show that he doesn't know everything. So we went to this uh, wise old man and uh, know, know everything, knowing everything and asked him, okay, what do I have in my hand? And he said, you have a butterfly? So that, okay, and is it alive or is it dead? So he said, it's in your hands. Uh. <laughs> so it is in our hands, I think, the, the answer first. Of the, 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 the second perspective, in my opinion, is that I have a positive um, uh, answer because I think that Buddhism nowadays is uh, is fitting. It fits the how you say zeitgeist mm -hmm. uh, because you know I think uh, since the middle uh, the fifties of the previous century, many um, transitions has hap have been happening in philosophy. Humanism, we know every from, and we know Martin Luber, and many are the same um, transitions and changes were in clinical psychology. We got the intersubjective, and we got the relational. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the uh, uh, psychologists dared to say that they don't know and they, they are equal to their patients. And also we have the, as as you said. Um, 
uh, Iran, uh, the, the spreading of Buddhism and especially the socially engaged Buddhism all over the West in, in, in Europe and in, the, and in the States. And I think even via the socially engaged Buddhism and via teachers, teachers from the, the East, teachers from the West, things, and also that, that we can have therapists which are not, who are not um, socialized and uh, educated in the formal Western uh, institutes because people are uh, making, uh, leading uh, processes of therapy and they are not the clinical psychologists, you know, uh, from the universities and they also are spreading you know, teachers teachers Buddhist teachers are in a, in a, in a way they are change makers in, in the society in the Western society so in my opinion the linear line is going uh, for the, the spreading of the of the Buddhist uh, uh, therapies and the therapies and I the last thing that I have to say that I think that in Israel we have so many psychologists that are turning to to, to Buddhist uh, psychotherapy many of them and also in hospitals in Israel uh, hospitals like uh, medical um, in medical um, departments and especially in, in healthcare departments I feel maybe I'm not so objective because I'm focusing on that, but it is there. It is there. So this is my positive perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other contributions from the floor? Yes, what, what I thought what, what would be a bit of a threat to the future of, uh, of these therapies is that people who do this, they lose their, their ego and sometimes also like the, the drive of, of um, publications and research and for their ego writing their name all on the, those researches. Okay, they, they have kind of a bodhisattva path, so, so spread it, but more in interrelational and not getting their name onto it. So I think that's an, a, a kind of a threat of spreading the word. And also because th those people are mostly some bit introvert and using more the right brain and not the an analytical left brain of writing books, etc. So I, want, I was wondering if you could comment on, on it or if you recognize it. Yeah. Anyone would like to respond to any of those? Yeah. Uh, I, I invented a term, uh, I think, I, I didn't hear it before, therefore I think uh, it, it just came to me, I called it Buddhist Narcissism. Buddhist Narcissism. <laughs> Buddhist, Buddhist, Buddhist Narcissism. <laughs> Nazis, but <laughs> <laughs> no, Nazis. Uh, I don't know, but uh, Nazis, uh, you know, and uh, it's because of uh, if you uh, if you look in this uh, community sometimes, and also especially in uh, you know how how Buddhism is presented in a way. So it's also the cultural background which is overwhelming sometimes, like in the Tibetan tradition where you get mm. brocade in every in every corner and gold. And if you don't understand why this is, you're very much impressed. Like myself, I was very much impressed in the past when I met uh, this kind of culture, and uh, but I didn't know anything about it. And slowly, slowly, the and some more information. And, uh, you know, it's, on the other hand, here in the West, uh, especially if you, if you, uh, you, you, you try to get scientific, in a way, and you, you do uh, some research on certain subjects, um, um, it's, it's, it's really difficult to find uh, kind of, uh, how to say, um, uh, uh, to find good evaluated 
material which you can relate to, as I said before. And uh, therefore, um, it's more on the researchers themselves, if they are practitioners, um, it might be better. I'm not sure, but um, it's, it's very important that you practice what you're going for research, into research. And uh, I think it's a very, very important point that as, as well if you're a therapist or a doctor, if you, if you have theory of Buddhism or you practice Buddhism, this is a kind of difference. And uh, to, um, you know, uh, if, you, if you're serious with the um, Grateful Noble Path and the basics, this is one thing which is difficult enough. If you go to the six parameters, I think, you know, it's a, it's a subject in continuous practice, just this. And uh, um, therefore, I think, um, to sum it up, you need to have practice if you do uh, research on it, and you need to have practice if you teach or if you, uh, if you uh, practice uh, or if you are with a client. Uh, you know, it's, it's the most important point that you have self experience with what you. Ego part, but the other 
step foot, sorry, not step foot, but the other foot has to be in the heart. And you have both feet at the same time. And, you know, that's much easier than, you know, the water is soft, I would say. It's not that you want to dissolve the eager. It's very good to write an article and share it with someone, and you're going to be happy, and your heart's going to be happy if someone going to get some results from that. So, it could be nice, you know, combination. Um, something I, I, I'd like to chuck in a question myself, because um, I'd, I'd like your opinions and uh, audience opinions. But, um, you know, some, some things kind of, it seems to be seem self-evident. Uh, it seems self-evident that the, uh, the therapist should uh, have their own practice or be in therapy, uh, that the researcher should also know about practice, that, uh, uh, and so on. But, you know, I'm, I'm also conscious that certainly in Britain, the psychotherapy profession has gone through a certain um, uh, convulsion, um, not recently, um, but some time back, uh, in which um, it was long thought that, that everybody who practiced as a therapist should have been in therapy. Mm -hmm. And nearly every institute has now dropped this requirement because the research evidence is that being in therapy does not make you a better therapist. Um, there's no correspondence between the two things at all, or if there's any correspondence, it's that it makes you worse. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, also, if you go back a little bit further, Robert Karkoff, who was at one time an associate of Carl Rogers, did a whole big chunk of research that showed that education in therapy made you a worse therapist. <laughs> but the people who've done three-year degree courses in psychotherapy were much worse therapists <laughs> than people who hadn't. Um, and um, so, so things aren't always what they obviously, what you might self-evidently think must be the case, you know. And um, I, I wonder whether this has a, uh, you know, we're now talking about developing Buddhist therapies and, and I hear much the same things being said as were said by the early psychotherapists. Uh, I wonder, is it true? Um, anyway, I, I, I'd be interested to know what people think about these things because what's self-evident isn't always borne out by research or evidence or in the long run. Any views? So what, the, what is the question exactly? What is the question exactly if... if well, are, 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 are we in danger of sinking into the same trap? Uh, Zaf was asking, are we in danger of sinking into the same trap of, of, of becoming little sectarian groups? Oh. I think there's a danger of it. Uh, are, are we in danger of becoming rather precious about our practices as necessarily making us better as helping people? Do they? Do we know? Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying they don't. I, I just don't know. What I know is something that Elena uh, showed that if I follow my guts, I'm a good therapist. <laughs> right. Of course there has to be some uh, reflection in, my, in the back of my mind, but the main reflection is, is this useful for my client or not? That's the main reflection I have to make. And the rest is theory, is, is thinking, is uh, consideration. But my, my own practice is the moments I said something that surprised myself. For instance, somebody talks about his mother and I suddenly ask, but where is your father in this story? Which is evident. <laughs> no, it's a bad example because it's evident. But sometimes I ask, how is your grandmother? Tell me about your grandmother. I don't know why I ask this. Mm. And 
it's like a Rorschach test, I think. It doesn't matter <laughs> that I put it this way. But it helps my client to... Kind of you yourself are thinking, well, where did I get that from? Yeah, I don't know where I get that from, but yeah. it's not important that I know that. The important thing is, does it help? Mm. That's the only scientific... And that's not an easy thing to teach people. No, no, that's, mm. not, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. It's not evident. <laughs> it's, yeah. Can I add to that? You know, I mean, I, I do a lot of teaching of therapy and it's totally difficult. I mean, how do you teach people mm -hmm. to have? <laughs> yeah, and also, you know, there's been some uh, research also what kind of therapies. There's so many ways of doing therapy. Mm. And what's the most efficient one or the most helpful one? And in certain cases, you know, you can say cognitive therapy is good for such and such problems. But in general, what they found out is not so much the, the method or the um, uh, the approach, but the person, the person of yeah. the therapist, yeah. that's really important. So that comes back to the subject of you know our own practice that somehow um, uh, shapes us or transforms us, which might make might make us better equipped to be of help. And um, I like what you brought up. You know, we really don't know. And for me, uh, and that's what I learned from, from Bernie Glassman, um, uh, whether you work with dying people or as a, with a therapy, uh, in a therapeutic situation, uh, when we, and, and that's why I'm adding to you, when we can really come from this open space of not knowing, mm -hmm. still we have, you know, our tools somewhere, but using our intuition and coming from not knowing, and then bearing witness to whatever the client or the other person is bringing in, really deep listening and bearing witness to their suffering, then, you know, somehow from not knowing and bearing witness, compassionate action will come, you know. You will ask how your grandmother. Not because you made it up, but because it arises from being in tune, attuned to the person, um, from this openness and their witness, so that's not what came up for me. Can I add something? Yes, yes, uh, mm. For me, it appears that, it appears that uh, it's a lot to do with translations of terms of Buddhist psychology and uh, formations, or even the sutras and the tantras and how they've been translated in the past and how it changed until now. So if you find uh, books from the first editions of uh, um, the sutras um, by Karl Eugen Neumann, uh, which had been an Austrian uh, philosopher, uh, and you compare it with uh, the Pali Khan translation from Jana Monika, it's, it's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. in the notion and, and yeah, in, 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 in yeah. English as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, if Nyana Konika had been asked why he chose the term mindfulness or Achtsamkeit in German, he said, because to me it's the best term, that was his uh, answer. And uh, everyone just re refers to this term Achtsamkeit. But Achtsamkeit in German is quite difficult because Achtsamkeit has a notion of uh, an index finger like that. You know, it's more on, on the attention level, on the attention side, and not so much on mindfulness or a broader mind or something. It's completely different. So, it's uh, and Achtsamkeit is just the the term in German. You know, and it's. Uh, I find it powerful <laughs> because I, I, I can't relate to this kind of Achtsamkeit. You know, I know what is meant, but Neumann just said inside for Sati. You know, and Sati itself, it's, come, it's deriving from the term Sarati, which means reminder or 
mm -hmm. reflection more. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so I think it has to do a lot with um, discussion, uh, sharing, and uh, exchange of information and translation um, through practicing or applying it. And the application of uh, you know Buddhist experience with clients is highly individual. This is my opinion. It's highly individual. So um, yes, <coughs> okay. Yes, well, I think that it's it, it it might be very hard to be compassionate with your clients when you have not uh, been with your own uh, pains or fears. So even if you would have been in Buddhist practice and then spiritually bypassing your inner world. How, how, good, how good are you as a therapist in resonating and feeling true compassion when your client is in pain? So I, I make a point for, for being in therapy or being in deep uh, self inner work uh, through Buddhist practitioner, but then not with spiritual bypassing. Your inner world, so that's uh, that's my mm -hmm. point. I my point, but I'd like yeah. to hear from yeah. all the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I was wondering uh, if it's uh, just a matter of individual uh, choice. Uh, how you um, um, do your approach uh, of uh, psychotherapy, or is it perhaps a more general development in, in Western thinking? Uh, so that uh, perhaps you can say there is a, a paradigm change in Western thinking uh, because uh, if you look at the development, uh, for instance, of uh, behaviorism, uh, it was uh, first uh, it was thought we can do some engineering from the outside uh, uh, to uh, change the behavior. Uh, and then, it, well, it was um, clear that uh, uh, the thinking, the insight, is also important uh, to uh, uh, help uh, people and uh, cure them. Uh, so, but then uh, again, it um, it was more concentration on uh, uh, well, uh, uh, it's uh, the defect uh, of logical thinking that has to be repaired. Uh, so, uh, in, in, in the uh, early days of uh, cognitive uh, uh, therapy, so and um, well, and, and there's also a stress on, on self-control and all these uh, concepts. But now you see it's a change of uh, it's not about uh, uh, getting more and more self-control. Uh, it's uh, uh, more about things like acceptance and uh, letting loose. Uh, so uh, there is not really a um, um, well, um, possible for uh, getting a solution for existential uh, problems, uh, so to say. So, and um, also in uh, how you deal with, uh, with, with cancer, uh, uh, if you treat it like a medical problem, then uh, you see that uh, people uh, are not, uh, feel they are um, uh, helped, uh, they are not, um, uh, you don't help them uh, only by approaching on a, t on a, a technical and uh, medical way. So it's natural that there, um, I think there is a shift to, uh, um, well, the use for uh, what would you now call compassion uh, based uh, um, uh, care for the dying. So. Uh, in, well, in all these fields, um, you see a lot of uh, influence of a reception of uh, Buddhism uh, to solve a, uh, a, a lack in uh, the thinking of, of Western thinking. So uh, I think that, well, if you uh, ask about uh, uh, what is the, the in influence of uh, Buddhism on uh, Western therapy, then perhaps you must say, uh, well, there's a, a big influence because it, uh, it fills in uh, the gap that was there in, uh, in Western thinking. So that uh, perhaps you now can say there is a sort of uh, paradigm change uh, that is a sort of necessary uh, development in Western thinking itself, but it could not uh, be solved uh, um, internally. So it. Uh, 
it needed something from outside to uh, help this uh, development. Uh, yeah, I think that's very interesting. And, and, and some of what you're saying is that, that um, the developments in, in Western therapy are reflections of some deeper philosophical paradigm. Mm -hmm. and, and Buddhism has contributed to that. And I suppose if we're talking about the future, mm -hmm. which way do we think that's going to go? Where does it go from here? You know, at the moment, we're in the midst of, and we call this conference mindfulness to heartfulness, because mindfulness is, is like the big thing at the moment. How long will that last? What's coming next? Where is it going? Where's the philosophy going? Is, is this the end point of the development of the Western paradigm? Or is it just the beginning of something completely different? Well, I, I think, well, uh, the, what, uh, what is... Uh, uh, accepted now and, and the reception that was uh, necessary and well I think it will not be the end uh, of the development but it will not uh, be uh, uh, well wiped out uh, again uh, it will not go away uh, I think because uh, it, it's a matter of uh, if discovering what helps uh, people and if you say well here we can't help uh, we are um, uh, um, we have lack of uh, means of how to help, yeah. and then you add some uh, more means yeah. that are prove out yeah. prove to be helpful. Then that uh, <coughs> will not uh, go away uh, anymore. I think. Perhaps I can reply shortly. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, maybe it's the end. Maybe you know uh, you, you never know because actually compassion is. Universal. Mm -hmm. and yes, where do you go after that? It's a universal state, I would say. So, so compassion is, uh, is not specific Buddhist. And skillful means are found in every religion, in every path. So, uh, as Nagarjuna said, you know, it's. Uh, the truth, uh, if, if someone claims the truth for himself, it can be the truth, you know, something like that. You know? So uh, I think maybe it's the end, maybe it, uh, every, like every end, it's a new start for something new. Yeah. I just want to say that maybe uh, like a side issue, I think this, this discussion is a redefinition of what professions what professions are, because it's some kind of a structural issue of how a philosophy meets a profession. And I would say that one common denominator which I would suspect would stay for professions is an ethical code. And this, for me, is the answer of why practitioners should practice themselves what they preach for from an ethical point of view more than from a practical point of view because I imagine there are a lot of uh, uh, factors that contribute to the fact whether you are a good therapist or not and one of them could be have you gone under, have you ever been treated yourself but this is one of them but from an ethical point of view I think it's very crucial for you to set an example and to say that I'm taking care of myself if I want others to take care of themselves as well and I think that's more, as I said, from an uh, ethical point of view and not from practical. And I think discussing uh, a Buddhist therapy, whether it's a profession or not, I think it could be, it could expand the definition of profession but it must have an ethical code. So I think this is something that is uh, crucial. <coughs> I was thinking about this um, kind of question, should we have a therapy or a practice for a therapist? And we actually don't know, yes, we, we don't know. And then, okay, if therapist doesn't have practice, and then my, my next question was like, okay, what sh should he have? Because he has somehow to have some kind of, you know, influence on what's going on, and then I reflect what's going on in my practice, in my life, and I see what really influenced me is in relationship, relationship with other people. 
because this is actually where we learn this love and compassion. And when, uh, that's why we keep going back to childhood in therapy because when mommy loves in the uh, childhood, that's when the baby learns what love is. And what, oh wow, someone's loving me. <laughs> and then you can really share that experience further. And then we go in life and we have teachers. You, you, you want to have a Buddhist teacher, okay. You want to have a therapist, okay. It could be your partner, it could be your friend, but there's some kind of community, a very close uh, relationship where you can really get that experience. And so that, that's, that's what makes changes, actually. And then the other thing I, I'm thinking, okay, why did we have that rule everyone had, need to have a therapy? Uh, for therapists, because how you can check what he's doing during the session, <laughs> if he's ethical or not, and we can check on a result, really, if client are getting results and happy and coming back, probably like that, but I don't think there's a good answer to that, like, solid one, it's it's very debatable, but with, uh, all, for now, for me, everything comes down to relationship, it doesn't matter where, where you get them, is it a community, a therapy, okay. Um, I think that uh, we, we, maybe instead of talking about schools or methods or, we have to speak about people or therapists, like generally speaking, because I think, you know, therapy, uh, generally speaking, is like, and all, and all the development or elaboration of therapy and all these schools together, it's maybe it's like a painting of Jackson Pollock. You know, you put this and you put this, and you, you never you never lose anything, anything. But you and in order to do it correctly, no, I, I meant it. And in, in 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 order to do it correctly, correctly, we always always I think have on one hand practice, as uh, you said, Tani, and um, I have a joke about practicing, but if you want, I'll tell you later. <laughs> so, and well, later, we haven't got time. <laughs> it's so it's to practice, and on the other hand, we need always, even if we are very, very old in our profession, we need supervision. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is the answer for the ethical uh, question and uh, issue. We need peer supervision, we need supervision, we need supervision and we need to practice. And then I think we can do better and better going to our inspiration, but we need to practice and we need to be super, to supervise and to be supervised. Can I Yeah, uh, I probably I am the non, only one non-Western person. <laughs> no, okay. You are, because I, again, I'm trying to stick to the, uh, to the subject, because it's the subject is the future of Buddhist-informed therapies and the compassion-centered practice in Western healthcare. Healthcare, immediately to me, is not just psychotherapy. It's, you know, hospitalization. We're not talking about that. Just if we, just, if I just confine to that point, uh, as an observer of Western healthcare, I think, I think it, it, it has a future, a good future uh, for the best Buddhist informed therapies and compassion centered practice to be part of the healthcare in the Western society, if I may say so. Uh, uh, maybe not much, not much a future uh, with compassion centered practice as with Buddhist informed therapists. Am I clear about this? I don't, compassion centered practice, because you know, in Western traditions, uh, Christians can, can, can provide as much compassion or love, what they call love. I'm not going to argue what's the difference, uh, but the Buddhist informed therapist is new, relatively new. Uh, how much, and then how much hope, how much future? Is there from the Buddhist team, from the therapist? Well, David, you have a better chance to say something about that. Uh, but I think it's going to take a while for mindfulness-based 
stress reduction or something to die, to wind to wind down. I I, I think uh, I feel okay. Probably it's going to be there for a long time. Uh, but it doesn't mean that Buddhist informed therapists have to wait until my MBSR MCT wind down. Okay? Why I say MBSR MCT or mind Western, uh, Western uh, version of mindfulness is going to last for a while? My observation is because this is something that the Western uh, culture in general lacks. Why is this? Because Western culture compared to Eastern culture relatively looks to the future. And if uh, looks to the future and looks to, uh, you know, the savior is transcendent but without. But mindfulness is a, just a, uh, a complementary. Mindfulness is, a, is, is, is pulling you from the future to right now and pulling you from the, the transcendent without to right now here, within. So it's a great contribution. Uh, it's a great kind of, a, what's the word? A, not a compensation, it's a uh, uh, com com it's complement, complement mm -hmm. complementary yeah. to what you don't have traditionally in mm -hmm. Western culture. So that's why I think there's a future. And it, it has, as you said, it's a big, it's a big deal already in, in the West. So I think it's not going to last for a while, maybe decades. Uh, but it doesn't mean you have to wait again. You can, you can launch your Buddhist informed the therapies, uh, free, uh, independent of, say, Western paradigm. You can go ahead with that. But then and again, the problem is, I think somebody was talking about this, how are you going to make it work ethically and professionally? Without all those, uh, you know, uh, standard uh, measurements, how do you evaluate, how do you evaluate the, the outcome? What is the ethics uh, for a Buddhist informed therapist? All these things. So if you work out this, if you work out these things, you can. I think it will. Buddhist informed therapist will also go a long way. Yeah. yeah. And and not, but not much with compassion-centered practice. I think. Christianity has this already in their tradition. They can just revive it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're, we're, I think we're running towards the end of our time, aren't we? So let's so hear from you, okay? And then I think we need a couple of words from each people on the panel. No, Miyoke okay, okay, wants to say something, yeah? yeah. <laughs> There's also quite a pushback against mindfulness going on uh, because of the lack of uh, the philosophical foundation because people become more mindful to be, you know, play games or to be a better worker, but not for the intended purpose of Buddhism. Be a better soldier. Yes, a sniper. sniper. Um, so, but I'm not a therapist, but what I find for myself as a priest, I have a lot of power. And so that, and I would imagine for a therapist, you have lots of power with your clients. And what's incumbent upon me as a priest is that my practice must be very developed so that I don't abuse that power, mm -hmm. so that I recognize that each person I encounter is their own teacher. Yeah. I'm just a guide. Mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. ask the questions, as you were saying, I don't know where they come from, yeah. but that intuitive connection that we have to each other brings forth the correct questions mm -hmm. and somehow it leads them to find their answers. Mm -hmm. And I'm just a support. Yes. Uh, so, shall we hear from the panel? Um, do you want, should we go the opposite way around? <laughs> 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 we all have the last words. <laughs> I don't have much to add to what we've heard already. Um, no, I don't have much to say. <laughs> Besides that I'm leaving in 10 minutes, so I wish you a wonderful <laughs> evening and a very wonderful day tomorrow. Yeah, yeah um, I don't have to add so much as well, but um, perhaps uh, it's, it's, I think it's really important uh, what you said about ethics. and uh, But ethics as well are not 
specifically Buddhist. So I think, you know, it's, a, it's really important to have a kind of common spiritual uh, aspect of ethics in terms of uh, uh, applying uh, techniques or meditation or methods uh, in uh, therapies. And uh, I hope that there will be a kind of uh, uh, openness uh, to other traditions as well. That uh, this kind of the, the different approaches and contributions also from Christianity, from the Jai tradition and then as well, from every tradition can just be summarized in a way in that uh, we find out which which part we can use, which part we can develop. Uh, and I think, I think it's just more a, uh, important for the implementation of this kind of uh, therapies in the West. There's one thing I would like to say. <laughs> I didn't want to get into a discussion, but I feel that um, it is really important to uh, bring compassion in the education in yes, healthcare. Yes. I was married to a doctor, my son is a neurologist, and mostly um, for nurses it's a little different, but especially doctors in their education they don't learn how to relate to deep suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's so much burnout and there's so um, often not enough connection because it's so difficult to relate to suffering and I think that's one of the things that coming from a Buddhist perspective, which is not exclusive Buddhist, I'm really happy to mention that, but that's what we can contribute in education so that the, uh, both medical health care and uh, mental health care um, um, can be improved for the people on the receiving side and for the professionals as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I would join you about compassion for doctors. It's important to teach them how to take care of themselves and because yeah, this is missing part. Uh, but I would also just want to share how much I enjoy uh, all this conference because we are all so different. I mean, I'm a psychiatrist and we have priests here and I have a really nice community in Russia for whom I can say, you know, I go to this conference, they're going to be real Buddhist priests around me, I'm going to talk to them. <laughs> and they all really take pictures. <laughs> it's like art, you know. <laughs> And on the other hand, you have to be, like we've been talking today with Gordon, you have to be real nuts to be a psychiatrist. <laughs> and combine it with Buddhist psychology these days. And I really like in that no matter what's going on on different levels, we do it. We talk about it and we join. And I think that's, that's the future for openness, you know, when we meet and we talk, and I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, what kind of ideas will we'll work up. And I really enjoy, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been uh, here since two hours or so, and uh, tomorrow I have to leave because my father died, and mm -hmm. I have to organize the uh, cremation and all these things. But I can join Elena uh, by saying that I feel uh, it's nice, even if, it's, if I just arrived, it's a nice atmosphere of sharing. Mm -hmm. And I also want to um, um, uh, acknowledge that uh, one of my observations of Buddhism in the West during several uh, years is that or people are, or they come into Buddhism by meditation practice, or they come into Buddhism by therapy. And what to me is a lack is in the middle of this. Buddhism is more than meditation and practice. It's an ethical and a philosophical and a 
or what you want, way of living. And what worries me a bit is the lack of teachers. Uh, for the moment, I don't see the media uh, a lot. I feel that in my practice, I, I since a year and a half, I'm a Buddhist therapist officially on my website and all these things before I didn't mention it exp explicitly. What I feel more and more is the need of uh, or a group, a supervision group, or a teacher who watches over me because I can think that I'm a good therapist, but <laughs> that has to be seen, that has to be seen from others too who can observe me. So I think that's a lack in Buddhism in general, the ethical points, the ethical attitude or approach. And in uh, as therapists or workers, uh, I say in uh, healthcare, how are we supervised by who and uh, Well, thank you all very much. Splendid, splendid. I, I, I think, you know, I myself, I can echo some of these points, that, that um, I, I got involved in all this therapy and Buddhism and all this sort of thing in, in, in the late 1960s and early 70s, which have a certain reputation um, as, a <laughs> as a, um, a period of um, great opening up, liberalization, experimentation, diversity, people generating new ideas, new approaches, new uh, methods, you know, and um, taking quite a lot of risks in the, in the, in the process. And uh, since then I, I've lived through a period of, of things in a sense becoming more and more tight. And uh, with, with, the, with what's happening with, with like Buddhism and mindfulness and so on, there's a sense of opening up again now. And um, I find that rather wonderful. So, thank you all very much. As you said, great diversity here, even on this panel, um, but in the room too. And um, may we have a good day tomorrow. Thank you very much.